important to people living here in the Pacific Northwest. And now, your host, Bruce Broussard. Welcome again to this segment of the Oregon Voters Digest. I'm Bruce Broussard, your host. Well, today, joining me uh, in this Oregon Voters Digest mayoral debate uh, is Fred, Fred Stewart. Fred's been with me for quite some time. He's kind of like a co-host here, too. <laughs> but he's done something that, uh, that's very outstanding, and I'm going to give him the give him the pluses on that piece. He's basically put this piece together, and I'm really excited about it. And I'm sure that you out there as in, here in the Portland metro area, this is a very important race. I think we got two viable candidates, uh, uh, individuals that I've known for a number of years, uh, and, and the one of which, uh, 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 Jeff will always make the point about, hey, I'm not Joe. I'm talking about his dad, whenever I do, but, I, but I've always done that. Anyway, but anyway, but anyway, we've got two guys here that, as far as I'm concerned, have been, been very responsible, uh, been very active, if you will, in their own rights. Right, mm -hmm. Fred? Very, very active in their own rights and, uh, and very caring, if you will, for the city of Portland. So what we're going to do today is that uh, Fred has put together, we've put together some questions and whatever that we're going to basically give to the candidates to respond to. And, um, and I think that's going to be good. And I'll be right up front with you. We've shared this with them because this is not about snuff the stars. We want to give them the opportunity to be able to communicate to you. And then, uh, this, as you note, this is going to be on YouTube. So you can email this, uh, this candidate, this, can this, this particular uh, debate, if you will, if you want to call it a debate. I think it's just a, basically getting their opinions and their feels about uh, what they, how they will represent certain areas or whatever. So with that, we'll just jump right on in there. Fred, you want to say a couple of points before we get right into the day? No, not a lot. I just want to thank both of you for coming here. I think uh, Jefferson and Charlie are two of the most important leaders we've got in Portland right now. Um, as most of you know out there that know me, I'm not very happy with uh, the level of leadership we have on city council. And I'm very excited about Steve Novick uh, getting on city council. And I'm ex very, very excited about either one of these two. Um, of course, I've come out and said I'm supporting Jeff. But I know uh, that no matter who wins, um, we're going to do very good. So uh, enjoy tonight, and uh, feel free to share this on YouTube. Great. Thank you. Like, he's, like he's running or something. Yeah, running? Well, he has. You know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right, right, He's right. been there and done that. Well, okay, that's, so this is the format of the show. We're going to ask a question, and then they've got, um, we've got a timekeeper out there. Fred's daughter sitting right up front here, and she's the timekeeper. That's Hunter. Hunter. They don't get to see, can't see Hunter. Yeah, but Hunter's, yeah. but Hunter's, Hunter's also right our there. studio audience. There she, there she goes. There she's <laughs> looking right at us, too, by the way. Yeah. So what we're going to do, we're going to start off, I'm going to probably ask for the, ask the first question. And uh, it's in doing your first term in office as mayor, what are the three specific goals you want to accomplish? But as part of that, I'd like for you to also reflect from the standpoint. You hear, you hear this thing about uh, are we better off now in the city of Portland than we were during the time that you guys were very much involved? Not to interrupt if you. you want. We, we need to get, let them both have an inter, introduction. Well, we can use well they can do that. They're going to okay. use that as part okay. of the introduction okay. aspect of it. But I think I want to. We sort of want to set the tone for your for questions that are going to be coming up. So you're going to identify yourself, talk about yourself, or whatever. But the whole idea is to kind of give a feel for for what do you feel. In fact, the, and the other thing is the rationale. Why are you running? The whole idea. Want to start with you, Jeff? Okay? Sure. Uh, my name is Jefferson Smith. I'm running for mayor because this is my hometown and I want to help get it working better for more people. And those are sort of the three general goals, more specific objectives within each. Would like to see us reduce unemployment by at least two points during my first term. That won't be primarily my job. In fact, most of the credit that will be due will have to do with what happens by Portlanders and what happens with the global economy. But I'd like to see what we can do for uh, smart economic development strategies, focusing not only on how to attract out-of-state businesses, but what we can do to help grow and cultivate early-stage businesses. And I was proud to be named the 2011 uh, Small Business Champion for some humble work we're doing, trying to raise the awareness around that shift and help uh, some small businesses around the state. I think we could do even more in the city of Portland. Second is getting the city working better, just the operations of city government functioning better. This is an area about which I have some passion. It's why I worked on online voter registration, on budget transparency. It's why I carried a bill on the House floor to prioritize frontline services during times of budget cuts, and that can mean trimming middle management during those mm -hmm. times. It's also why I want a single three-digit telephone number for all non-emergency government phone calls. 
just like you have 911 for emergency police and fire, 311 for everything else. Right now, I think I'm told there are 130 public telephone numbers for the city of Portland and 13 hotlines. There's a seven digit number that most people don't know that'll tell you what those other numbers are. But if we can learn from New York and other cities that have done some consolidation of citizen service to create a little more seamless uh, experience when people are trying to access government services, I think we can make government work better. And then third, getting the city work for more people. I represent the easternmost district in the city of Portland, very often a place that has been forgotten over the last 20 or 30 years in our city. And trying to see the whole picture when we budget, understanding that if folks are working to gentrify North Portland, inner north and northeast Portland, where we are right now, while we fail to invest in streets and parks and sidewalks in East Portland, we've now had 10 to 15 uh, thousand members of our minority communities moving from inner east to outer east Portland right. just the last 15 years. Mm -hmm. So trying to see the whole picture better and try to improve how we play with education, particularly early and summer education, and we can talk more about that okay. as we go forward. Okay. Let's take two minutes on that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Two minutes. Charlie. Well, thank you very much. I'm Charlie Hales, and I'm running for mayor because the city of Portland needs leadership. It needs that ability to bring people together and get things done, not just talk about what should be or study things, which we sometimes do too much here in Portland. And it needs someone who has the experience in both business and city government to make things happen. And I bring 10 years of business experience and 10 years of city government experience to this office. And this is not the starter job in the city of Portland. This is the job where you need someone to walk in there on day one and be able to make things happen. Some things that I want to see accomplished during my first term is first we've got around the corner on funding for public education in this city. We've been holding it together with duct tape and bake sales and goodwill for mm -hmm. 20 years since we passed Measure 5 in this state. And there are a lot of people that have put heart and soul into keeping our school system together, but it's a problem. And it's not something we can just keep putting off. So we have to have stability and certainty for parents and kids. We have to have a complete curriculum in all of our high schools. We have to have better connections to work. And that's the second thing that I want to see during my first term. I want to see more family wage jobs in Portland. Not just more people working, but more people working in a way that they can have a chance of being in the middle, middle class and buying a home. You know, that's the American dream, and it should still be true here in Portland. And that's why I'm so proud to have the support of organizations like uh, the Unified Food and Commercial Workers uh, and the Service Employees International Union the Teamsters, the Carpenters, people that work with their hands and try to get into the middle class, and we need more of that in this city. And then the third thing that I want to see, and it's, it's pretty critically important when you look at the city budget, is for the city to focus more on basic services. Only 44 cents of our property tax dollar today is going into the general fund. Hmm. Think about that. 44 cents is going into police and fire and parks and the basic things that the city does. So there's a need for good management in City Hall as well. Okay. All right, Charlie. Fred, you want to take a question? Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm going to ask one of, the, one, of the, one of the short questions here. Um, you guys, um, do you feel it should be a priority for the city of Portland to pave the 65 miles of unimproved roads we have in Portland? Um, if so, how? If not, why not? Uh, each one of you have got uh, one minute on this one. We'll go with you. Absolutely. In fact, if you go on my website, charliehales.com, you'll see specific proposals for this and other things that we need to do in this city. We, you know, we annexed a huge area into the city in East Portland because it didn't have sewers. And then over time, around the edges of the city, there's been development on unbuilt streets. So there's this huge backlog of unbuilt streets in the city. And there's also a backlog of just regular repaving. When I was commissioner in charge of transportation, we had less budget, but we repaved more miles of streets every year than are, is the case now. So we need to both prioritize that basic maintenance because that's a responsibility that we would be foolish to continue to miss. And then we need to start systematically building out those unbuilt miles of streets. Now, I want to give credit to Mayor Adams. He's come up recently with a more flexible set of standards for how those streets get developed to give people a menu to choose from. But we're still waiting for people on those streets, many of them lower income residents, to pay for them themselves. And that's not going to work. Okay. Jeff, you want to respond? 
Yeah, we need to prioritize improving our unimproved roads, but I want to be a candid about a couple of things. One, we will not improve 60 miles of roads, 65 miles of roads. We probably won't get done 50 in a term of whoever is the next mayor. Second, if we want to improve those roads, we're going to have to be thinking about options in addition to standard paving. Right? If you add paving, and related to what Charlie was saying, that uh, if you stick to standard paving plus sidewalks plus curb cuts plus crosswalks you get pretty darn expensive per mile we need options that are give us a range of things that we can do and what I would call is to Portlanders to be thinking about innovations that help us and understand this very often you'll talk to somebody who does paving and they say oh it's so expensive I could pave that road for blank dollars what we're not understanding is not only do we have federal requirements with respect to access for all of our people, but we've also got to connect it to a sewer. You take a dirt thing and you cover it, make it an impervious thing, that water goes somewhere. And if it can turn into a flood, that's bad. So we've got to figure out innovative things. I've heard things from linear parks to cobblestone streets, if the neighbors want them. So we need some additional options. Okay, okay. And bringing one something that's very current of late, of late was the whole issue of fluoride. That was an issue that, in fact, is still stewing, if you will. I mean, the city council just, I guess, they unanimously voted it in. But there were many concerns, and, and one of the concerns was the fact that people just didn't know what they were talking about. I'd be right apart with you. I mean, I read a lot about, you know, pros and cons, but I really didn't get the meat of the matter. And I'm sure that uh, you guys are knocking on doors constantly day in and day out. And, and Jeff, I'll ask you this question. The Portland City Council recently moved to add fluoride to the tap water of Portland residents. Do you agree with the deci this decision? And if you do, why? And if you do not, why not? And if, in fact, it should, if if you're one of your elected mayor, is this something that would be carried over to the to the mayorship? So to the, to the, the data mayorship? I've seen on public health has been pretty overwhelming about the public health benefits of mm -hmm. fluoridating water. We're healthier in most ways in Portland than just about any major city, uh, at least most major cities. Where that isn't true is dental health, and we have more dentists than almost any other city. So we clearly have an issue. My, where my disagreement is with how this has happened is I've had too many people who don't feel that they have the information, too many people who feel this has been done to them rather than done with them or for them. And we, I think, should have had a broader public discussion, uh, including at least a citizen jury process, maybe a public vote, so that people at least felt like this wasn't just something that was getting ram rammed down the literal throats of Portlanders. Now, there are 250 wonderful organizations that are pushing for this. I think that kind of discussion, some of it has happened. I think more of it could have and still could happen. And this isn't only uh, because people who aren't excited about fluoridating our water would rather have a different process, but because in Salem and Eugene, when they each fluoridated their water, Salem had a big process. Eugene had less of one. Eugene threw theirs out. Salem still fluoridates. So discussion with voters can very often be better for sustaining good policy decisions. Mm -hmm. You know, Charlie, when you answered this question, I was thinking about Frank Irons. Remember the time he, he brought the whole issue with the Bull Run, about the best water in the, in the Pacific oh, Northwest? Yeah. I mean, he bottled that stuff, yeah. and so I still have my bottle. <laughs> anyway, I, I, I was going to throw that out there. It might be stale by now. Nah. That was a while ago. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, I support fluoridation. I think the council is making the right decision for the same reasons that Jeff cited. I think the the scientific evidence is very clear that this has a profound effect on kids' teeth, and then the state of their teeth has a profound effect on the rest of our health. It's not just the condition of the teeth in your mouth that affects your whole body. So it's a big deal. That's why all these other cities are doing it. We should. Uh, we should always have a, a complete and open public discussion before we make a decision in this city. That's the Portland way. I think there has been a, a general atmosphere in City Hall lately of rushing things through in the last days of this administration, so maybe this picked up some of that taint, but it nevertheless is the right thing to do. I suspect it will still be a controversial issue at one level or another by the time whichever one of us is there next year. Okay, good. Fred? Okay, I'm going to get into a uh, somewhat of a controversial one. Um, you don't think fluoride's controversial? <laughs> <laughs> no, that, that's actually being, trying to be funny. I, okay, you are. I mean, honestly, I mean, if you got to read my Facebook, I, I've chosen not to say anything about that fluoride thing. It's, it's, but um, let's talk about the I-5 bridge. <laughs> um, we're going to give you each two minutes, starting with Jefferson this time, um, to talk about your, your general views about the bridge, what, and what you hope to accomplish, bridge, and let me end it this way. 
what is the main things you want the people of Portland to know of your perspective on the bridge? So covering the project in two minutes is a challenge, but yeah. I can be clear <laughs> about what I think. I think that this may be one of the biggest mistakes our region has made in the last 30 or 40 years. And the, uh, because it's not fundable, because the primary beneficiaries for the project, even though costs are roughly split, uh, primary beneficiaries are folks on the Clark County side. Uh, there's a trade-off between light rail and a big highway interchange. Both of those things are primarily to help Clark County commuters uh, who do pay Oregon taxes on the money they earn while working here. But we've seen lots of uh, lots of examples of people building big mansions, uh, maybe another casino, certainly another casino, maybe another baseball stadium all the while avoiding Oregon income taxes and Oregon land use laws, which are different on that side of the river than this side of the river. Mm -hmm. So the, and, and in describing the mistakes, the mistakes are legion. And I, know, and I know there's some good people working on the project. And I agree with the need for seismic safety. I agree with the need for freight mobility. I agree with the need for jobs. I think that if we, however, stick with the commitment, the decision to build that main span, to do the thrust of the current project, where most of what the proponents are saying now, most of the consultants who have earned, what consultants, engineers, and planners, about $160 million without laying a brick, what my friend the governor is saying, what most of the proponents are saying is, well, shave it down a little bit, but keep doing the same thing. Mm -hmm. I think we have to face facts. I think we have to be willing to say, all right, there are some basic needs we identified, but if we're not willing to reevaluate where we are, uh, then we will continue to waste money on consulting or we'll do something that's a major mistake and we'll be pushing the bottleneck to closer where we are right now, increasing traffic here, increasing asthma rates here, uh, and all the while not really planning for the future while uh, avoiding investments that we really need. It'll also require spending at least $400 million around the Rose Quarter and we don't have that money, right? But that's not a multi-state project where we'll get federal money from it. It's going to be hard to get the money from the state, and the city doesn't have that kind of money for a local project around the Rose Quarter. So I think this is an immense mistake, and it has been—it can be challenging to say that, but we need voters being willing to talk to their elected officials and ask for a willingness to face the facts. Okay. You know, this project uh, has been <laughs> under design for way too long. And it's cost way too much already because they've spent about $150 million planning the thing. And it's not a fundable, buildable project. I've said that all along. But I do believe there we have the capacity around here, and I know this because I've been able to accomplish it before, to bring people together and get something done that does match our values and that's practical. And the project that the two DOTs came up with that doesn't match our values and isn't practical. Uh, so I think the big difference between us on this issue and actually quite a few others is not what, what we think about the bridge. What the mayor of Portland thinks about the bridge is a factor, but a minor one. What matters more is does the mayor of Portland have the capacity to bring people together in this complicated environment of many agencies working together and get something done? And I do have that capacity. People know that. You can ride light rail to the airport and you could ride it 10 years early because I was able to bring people together and get that project done, by the way, for about what they've spent planning <laughs> this project. So I think the critical question is, is, do you have the experience of working on these big complex projects, bringing people together and, and bringing the thing in for a landing and not just any old thing, but something, again, that does match our values, that makes sense and is an investment for the long run. Getting light rail to Clark County is a good idea. Having a bridge that doesn't lift when barges go through is a good idea. 17 lanes across Hayden Island is not a good idea. You know, as a follow-up, if you don't mind, Fred, yeah, as a follow-up, thinking of the island and aspect of it, there are all sorts of activities in the, on the island as far as the residents are concerned. There's about a little over 2,500 residents that live there. Uh, there are major concerns about the, the lottery aspect of it, the, the distances that are there, the crime and things of that nature. And I know both of you have been very much involved in terms of people calling you up and going out and talking to those folks and whatever. Would you like to respond to that to a certain degree? Sure. Just kind of include them in, because right now they've got another, if you will, they've got another support. Oh, yeah. Hayden, a lot of people on Hayden Island are mm -hmm. feeling pretty put upon right yeah. now. First of all, there's this controversy. Then there's the controversy about what happens to West Hayden Island. Will their needs and the livability of their community be remembered? Uh, and then there's this mess with the Casino Row there. 
Um, in fact, in my case, again, you know, one thing I think Hayden Island, a lot of Hayden Island residents will remember is when that island got annexed to the city, there was a promise that a fire station would be built there as a, as a benefit to that neighborhood because of the congested highway being the only connection to fire services. And I got it built and one nice day cut the ribbon with a shiny fire ax. So I'm proud to have delivered before to Hayden Island and now they need to be remembered as a neighborhood, not just a place on the way to somewhere else. Yeah. Yeah. I would agree that we need to focus on it. However, I think that doesn't jibe with what we were just talking about. If we're committed to getting the current main span essentially done as it's planned, yeah, and, and that the primary cost savings, which is where the proponents are right now, understand for all that folks might say there's not a disagreement on this, there's a meaningful disagreement. There's a meaningful disagreement between something like the current plan that tries to save money by giving Hayden Island a smaller or no interchange, uh, or doing something meaningfully different, like the common sense alternative, but at least starting with, no, I'm not going to pledge to start this in the first year of my administration. That's not something that we should pledge to be ready on day one to do. Experience to bring that project in for landing isn't a good thing, it's a dangerous thing for the city. Now, what I think Hayden Island could be better served with, uh, with respect to a bridge, would be a local access bridge, right? Something like the, uh, the, the common sense alternative uh, calls for, and that thing has about 3,000 views on YouTube. It ought to have 20,000 views on YouTube. Everybody in the region ought to see it. It's a better answer. Okay, good. Fred, you want to go on? Oh, do you have a question? I just followed up on the other deal, but I, I do have an, another question. Yeah, go question. for it. Okay. Go for it. Okay, let's, let's talk to one one area that I thought was um, was very interesting, and that, and that's, that was from the Atlanta. The police, the police union is, all, is always being discussed. In the, in the city of Portland, you know, there's always issues about police. You know, it's a tough job. Let me, let me, let me say that right up front. It's a tough, tough job. Okay. And for some strange reason, we, folks have been having some tough time trying to articulate that in terms of educating the voting public about the definition of what police is all about. And maybe this might be an opportunity for us to do that because you're going to be one of you going to be picking that up, and it, 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 rather than doing the same old thing over and over and over and over, some way, shape, or form, someone needs to define what is police work and, and how do they involved. Okay, let's do two minutes so, each on that. Yeah, good. So, in fact, uh, and, and this was from Willamette Week, Nigel Jack, but I'll give you his question. But how can you reconcile? Oh, that's not that's not the one. Where's that police? Here it is, right here. Yeah. Where's that police piece here? Oh. Yeah. Well, I thought you asked asked him. You know, I can respond to what you said. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, think you, I, I thought that was a question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah well, that was yeah. good enough. That was good enough. That was good the, enough. Uh, <laughs> so there are a couple things <laughs> in there. One, yeah, I, it has occurred to me that the police union has tended to be more controversial and been less popular than a lot of other labor organizations. And there's probably a lot of reasons for that, including challenges we're having in public safety. I think another, it occurred to me, is that you know, there are a lot of people who like police who don't really like unions, and there are a lot of people who like unions who don't really like police. So some of it is just there in a tricky spot. The, uh, the city's also in a tricky spot with respect to public safety, and I've communicated with the police association about some of our disagreements. And some of the things I think we need to do going forward are amplified by the recent Department of Justice findings and recommendations, which include a couple of things. One, having an honest-to-goodness mobile mental health crisis unit. We have one now, but it's neither mobile nor a crisis unit. It's not uh, mobile because I think it's one vehicle in one precinct. It's not a crisis unit because it's not uh, provided as a first responder. Right? We need to amplify that in precincts across the city and make sure it can be a first responder rather than merely a backup or approaching the next day. Relatedly, uh, we need a real mental health crisis triage center. Right? A lot of what police officers are facing now isn't merely because of what's been happening to law enforcement. It's been an erosion of the social safety net, an erosion of mental health and homeless services dating back to the Reagan administration that now we have police officers and firefighters, and I'm honored to be endorsed by both, who uh, are very often health care deliverers and health care first responders as distinct from public safety agents. Mm -hmm. Uh, so we've got to face those facts. We also need a community policing orientation, a problem-solving culture, and we need to make sure we have a chief who's committed to that. I think our current chief is. We also need to make sure that when we have police leadership who's pushing in that direction, that the mayor backs them up. 
My job will not be to be the primary public safety policymaker, but to make sure we have the best people who are pushing for the kind of public safety we need. Okay. Johnny? Well, I will steer the police bureau clearly towards community policing, and we have wandered around in the road quite a while since Charles Moose was our chief. We had a chief from L.A. We've been all over the map on this issue. And I believe in that model of community policing, of officers that are working towards de-escalation, who know their neighborhoods, who know their neighbors because they live in the city. Only 30 percent of our officers now do. Uh, officers who are spending more time on uh, crime prevention, not just chasing 911 calls, who are working in partnership with groups like Connected, um, you know, groups like 1145 to intervene positively in the lives of our kids before they get involved in criminal activity. So there's a lot of work to do to make us a community policing agency. And I don't think any of us disagree that that's a good idea. I think the big difference here, again, is I've actually reformed the culture of a public safety bureau before. Uh, I did it with the Fire Bureau. As you know, that Fire Bureau was given to me with a little group called the Black Firefighters Association who they used to joke could meet in a minivan because there were only six of them. Um, and, uh, and I brought in a new chief who was a change agent and we put in place the trainee program that now has the Fire Bureau looking a lot more and being a lot more like the community it serves. And that isn't easy, and there are always forces of the status quo that will oppose that. And in my case, you don't have to wonder if I can turn the words into change. Yeah. 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 You know, this is a perfect opportunity to, to go ahead and get into Nigel Jaquise. Nigel Jaquise of Lambert Week gave us um, two questions, one individually for each one of you. So I'm going to go ahead and ask Jefferson his, and uh, then uh, Charlie, I'm going to ask yours. Um, for Jefferson, he says, how can you c reconcile your claim to, as the progressive candidate in this race with your endorsement from the police union? This is from Nigel Jaquise of Willamette Week. So I, I have not viewed my job or my intent to locate myself in a particular place on a p political spectrum. If what we mean by the progressive candidate in the race is the candidate that will see the whole city, that will listen just as readily to people who have not been traditionally engaged in our city mm -hmm. as to people who have traditionally made a lot of money on their dealings with the city, if what we mean is a commitment to the public interest, if what we mean is a commitment to the future and to the present and to this century, mm -hmm. uh, then I'm happy to accept that mantle. As for the police association, probably better to ask them for their rationale, for their endorsement. What they've told me is that despite our policy disagreements, that they trusted me to tell them what uh, I thought, that they trusted me to uh, attend to the basic needs of the city and be watchful of the budget, that my recent government experience in working with tough budgets, different from the 1990s when we were unloading truckloads of federal money. Uh, and I'm honored to have their endorsement and the firefighters endorsement and the teachers endorsement and, S and the Sierra Club and League of Conservation voters. And the fact that we have both the police endorsement and the independent party and the progressive party endorsement, I think might be a sign that we might be able to bring some of the elements of our community together and actually achieve what this city has not achieved over the last 30 or 40 years. People have been running for mayor, critiquing public safety and going after police officers since I was born. Mm -hmm. okay. Literally. Okay, now this is from Nigel Jaquise okay. from Lambert Week. We all know Nigel. Yeah. And um, Nigel's question for you is, what made you think it was legal to claim Washington residency on your tax return while claiming Oregon residency for voting purposes? Um, Great. No, okay. I'm, I'm really, this has been an issue that's come up a couple times. I'm really glad to have the opportunity to clear it up. Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't move to Vancouver, Washington. That's You hear that sometimes. I moved to Stevenson, Washington, yeah. 50 miles from here. Mm -hmm. No one would do that for tax reasons. I did it because I'd fallen in love with Nancy, and she had kids in high school. So our commitment was we'd live together in Stevenson until the kids graduated, and then we'd move back to my hometown of Portland, and that's what we did. And frankly, I kept voting in Oregon because I could, 
that you can be temporarily away. But if I'd known this would have been an issue, I would have changed my voter registration <laughs> because we were living in Washington, filing our taxes in Washington, and then we were living in Oregon. So it was all about love and family. It was never about taxes, but, you know, people can put a spin yeah. on things, and I'm glad to set it straight. Good. Okay. Good. Good. Appreciate that. All right. Them? Well, let's talk about a little bit about homelessness for a moment. And there's a question here. What are you going to do for out outreach of veterans in Portland with suicides, homelessness, and foreclosures? Portland has about 3,000 veterans, and we have a veteran hospital. I mean, give two minutes, but add the other homelessness situation that we have in the city of Portland. You know, it's always been an issue. You know, mm -hmm. you know, downtown, the business business folks are concerned about the fact that these folks are coming out and maybe causing them causing problems, get their business, whatever. Uh, the recent situation with Cameron down there at City Hall, the, the sleeping, there was a whole bunch of issues, and you know, yeah. they'll occupy Portland. So let's just get, just give an overall view of this whole piece from your perspective. Okay. Um, I've spent a lot of time lately yeah. learning ab about this issue, not just talking about it, because I think it's such a complex issue. You know, there's not one kind of homeless person. Right. So I've spent some time at Central City Concern and outside in. I was serving breakfast the other morning at New Avenues for Youth, and what those folks that are on the front line and those great nonprofits tell me is that there are more homeless people and their problems are more severe. The kids are falling through the foster care system with worse problems. There's worse substance abuse problems. There are worse problems with mental illness out there on the streets today, including veterans. And so I think the answer to that question, I think, vexes all of us. What do we need to do more? What do we need to do? More of the good things that are being done now by those frontline nonprofits and less of what the state did with deinstitutionalizing mentally ill people. I saw by today's story about this issue that the state is in the process of building a new mental hospital, not one from the bad old days, but a more humane, modern one, one in Salem and one in Junction City. That raises the obvious question, wait a minute, this is the population center of the state. There are more people here that need to be served. Why are we building in Junction City? So I don't know the answer to that question, but I want to find out. Yeah. I think a lot of this is going to come down to partnerships, that we won't be able to resolve this merely as a city. We have a moral obligation to do what we can and to do more, but that this has been a national problem that has grown for 30 years. Um, a couple of partnerships we should look to. One is regional. It's not accurate when people who are essentially trying to lobby for tax breaks and other things and, and trying to express grumpiness over our general city liberal leanings go and sort of say, oh, see, we're so nice to the homeless, they all come here mm -hmm. from everywhere across the country. It's not really accurate. The data doesn't bear it out. What is accurate is we bear a larger, we put in more resources than other regional partners, from Clark County, Vancouver, et cetera, to Washington County, Beaverton, et cetera. And I think calling for regional solutions to homeless funding and services uh, is something that the mayor needs to do, something that Metro needs to do, something that advocates in the homeless community need to be doing. Second, with respect to veterans, we need to make sure there is good job access. And I think there, it is legitimate to go to private sector employers and saying, all right, how are you doing with hiring veterans? I might not have the same moral authority to ask that question about people who are recently incarcerated. I might not have the same moral authority to ask about people who are getting uh, over addictions, but the question about veterans is a little easier. So I think we could actually call for private employers to do more hiring of uh, veterans, and yes, including veterans within publicly funded programs we do, but also trying to ask for the private sector to step up more when we have that ability to do it. Uh, a third is looking, working with the county on mental health services, is looking at how we budget, recognizing that uh, a lot of this is not within the ambit, is not within the control of the mayor, but improving relationships with the county commission, I think that can help. Uh, and one thing about that my recent government experience has and the work I've been doing for the last 10 years here in Oregon, here in Portland, building partnerships, building relationships, is hopefully we'll be able to um, uh, harvest some of that for the good of the order. Okay, good. Brent? Okay. Um, I'm going to ask you guys a question that was submitted to us by Steve Dean. This, will be, this is the last of the questions we got from the media people. We got one, of course, from each one from Nigel Jaquiz. This one's from Steve Dean of The Oregonian. I'm going to read it verbatim, okay? 
in far better times, the mayor of Portland brought a, a semblance of moral authority to the job. Sam Adams sacrificed his at the onset. Charlie Hales and Jefferson have already been embarrassed by their own struggles to tell the truth. Hales on obey the, the speed limit and remember a court date uh, Smith. Um, how can either of these guys convince a skeptical and judicated Portlanders that they will resolve, that they will restore and trust the dignity to the mayor's office? Okay. Let's start with you, Charlie. Well, I, as I said earlier, uh, the first issue I want to deal with is this charge that I moved to Stevenson, Washington, of all places, to evade taxes. That's obviously not the case. I moved there for family reasons. And, you know, frankly, I don't care if somebody wants to put a negative spin on that because I'm proud I did it. I did it for Nancy and our kids, and I'd do it again in a minute. So there are going to be things you do in your personal life that get a negative spin when you run for office, so be it. Secondly, my campaigns and I have made a couple mistakes in terms of facts that were wrong and things that we said or put out. And when we found out there were mistakes, we owned up to them and corrected them. Mm -hmm. And I'll never claim to be, you know, error free in my understanding or what I say. But when I make a mistake, I'll correct it. Now, when you make a mistake, some people call you a liar right away. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think that's the right standard. I think, or if you're willing to make a mistake, if you make a mistake and you're willing to correct it, then people ought to uh, hear that, and I hope they do. Jeff? Yeah, I've tried to be, I've tried to be pretty open uh, for the last year. I've now been running for mayor for a year, and a year and three days. Uh, that I am a woefully imperfect person. I've made mistakes in my life. Uh, have tried to improve every day of my life. I will acknowledge now that God nor my wife uh, are finished with me yet. Uh, I do try to own up to my own strengths and weaknesses. As far as the mistakes I've made, I can't really change them. I can accept responsibility and apologize and work to improve. Uh, what I can do is work for change in the city. What I can do is try to bring people together to solve problems that Portlanders are facing and seize opportunities that Portlanders are facing. Uh, what I can change is how we've addressed equity in our city, how we've made giveaways to developers and other boondogglers for the for their benefit but not to the benefit of the whole city what i can try to change is how we've made investments and haven't made investments in early education and summer education uh, that i'm not going to be able to wave a wand and go back to the previous times in my life what i can do uh, is while i won't have a magic wand i do have a work ethic that is uh, more pronounced than most people i know what I do have is an ability to listen and process problems. What I do have is a deep and abiding love and care and commitment to this city and this state and to the public interest, and I'll apply those to solve problems. Good. Good Here's one that I must say, I like both of your answers. <laughs> Outstanding. Here's one that I'd like to, you know, I mean, we all, we, we're all been talked down this particular road. I'll, I'll, I'll state the question, and then I'll just add a little bit to this piece. What is going to be your approach to bike transit policy in Portland? Now, the mayor, President Mayor, has spent quite a bit of time in lobbying towards the, the whole issue of bicycling here mm -hmm. in the city of Portland. But there are many concerns with, with citizens as far as uh, bikers are concerned. Uh, running stoplights, uh, you know, the, the, you know, a whole bunch of America. But how, the, the kind of monies, if you will, that are being spent on biking, if you will. Uh, streets, road, roadways are narrowing, if you will, you know what I'm saying, uh, taking quite a bit of this northeast Portland, you got all kinds of bikes. Don't get me wrong, I, I feel bike is fine, but as a senior, I can't ride bikes during the winter. Mm -hmm. And I want to know just basically an idea, will we continue the policy that we have right now in the book that Sam has basically lobbied for, and, and will we add to it, if there's some areas that you might add to it or delete? I mean, just whatever you think, mm -hmm. but talk about the whole issue, because there's a concern out here sure. about biking. So I do want to, I want to address the most important thing I want to address is the thing that you threw in about having an age-friendly transportation system. Yes. What do we do about an aging population, baby boomers who are retiring and driving less? But I don't think that is as simple as paving more highways or having more cars. Because as frustrated as the Oregonian editorial board might be and other folks might be about bicycles, 
I think the entire bike network in Portland was estimated at about $60 million. I think that's slightly more than a third of just the planning, lobbying, consulting on the Columbia River crossing. Mm -hmm. In terms of transportation funding, bikes aren't really our problem. The, uh, also, although I should ride a bicycle more often than I do, they are part of the solution. I didn't get into politics to be a bicycle advocate. I did uh, get involved in democracy to try to see the whole picture. And in seeing the whole picture, that does need to include bicycles. Yes, it needs to include cars. But we, if we're going to move 5,000 people into this city a year, as is what's projected, we don't have room for 5,000 cars either. Right? And a bike is littler than a car. But you know what else is smaller is a person walking. So how can we plan the city smartly so that it necessitates fewer long trips? Where I live, there are far fewer people who ride bicycles, far fewer people who take transit than most Portlanders. Not because they'd rather buy a car and pay for insurance they don't have money to pay for, but because there are fewer short trips, because the roads aren't as safe. So my policy would not be bikes over cars. My policy would be seeing the whole picture, would be a balanced transportation system, and would be working towards an age-friendly transportation system, mm -hmm. which isn't just bikes or cars, which is places to sit, places to hide from the rain, mm -hmm. bus service that makes sense, mm -hmm. buses that you can get on a little more easily uh, and, uh, and a little more safety. So safety first, seeing the whole picture, and trying to have a transportation system that works whether you're eight or you're 80. John, what do you think? You know, I'm running for mayor because I want to give people not just hope, but stability and success in our school system and because I want to, as I said, provide more family wage jobs in this city and there's a lot that the city can do, not just wait and hope there, but also be an activist, effective partner in growing those family wage jobs in the city. And then the third thing is we do need to refocus the city on basic services, community policing, better parks in more neighborhoods, and repaving the streets that we have as well as continuing this agenda of giving people a choice of how to move around and there are a lot of places in the city where those choices don't exist where the kids are walking down a travel lane to get to school that's not okay that's not safe and it's not choice and so building out a system where there are sidewalks where there are bike lanes over time is a smart and responsible thing to do and in fact, I've been part of that in the city before, that we have given a lot more people transportation choices. We've got a lot of work to do to extend that blessing and that opportunity to every neighborhood in the city and to keep our transit system together so that there is good bus service in every part of the city as well as continuing to run the trains. So there's a lot of work to do on this front. But first, we've got to show people that we are focused on basic services. We're going to be good stewards of what we have. And then the mayor has an obligation, regardless of how I or Jeff might assign the, the Transportation Bureau, the mayor has an obligation to get out there and explain to people how the money is being spent and be able to look people in the face and tell them that we're not playing shell games with their money and spending Water Bureau money on things in transportation or Transportation Bureau money and things that have nothing to do with either. And I think there's been a lot of erosion of confidence about how the money's being spent, and that's helped to polarize this feeling that the bike community has that they're, you know, they're under attack and folks that are driving cars that maybe the bikes are getting all the money. And the mayor has a, a job to do there to be a teacher as well as a good manager. Okay, and I, and I, I like the idea you said you talked about the seniors for a moment because we are, we are in, a, yeah. in a major flux of, of baby boomers, if you will, and they're, they're going from point A to point B. I mean, some of the seniors were telling me something about, hey, Bruce, what about golf carts? <laughs> if, they, if they could widen up those lanes enough yeah, to get golf carts, you know, yeah, I can go to Safeway, I can do this, that, and the other, but right now I can't go anywhere. And then there's a the whole issue with crime and whatever, but, but that's an area that I think we need to really focus on. Baby it's a major priority. Are, are it's right. really important yeah. for yeah. the city. Fred? Okay, good. Just, I think we only got like about two more questions here. Um, Keep going. We got more. Okay. We got enough time. <laughs> All right, good. All yeah. right. How's our studio audience doing? Hey, you doing good? Doing good. Doing good. She's still there. You guys um, doing good. Got a, got a question for both of you um, regarding um, urban renewal. Do you, each, each one of you, uh, we'll start off with Charlie, uh, do either one of you see any problems with the current urban renewal policies? And if you do, uh, what would you do to change them if, you're, if, if you uh, think they're successful? Why do you think they're successful? Yes. Start off with you. I can answer that yes or no question with a yes. I do see some problems with our current <laughs> use of urban renewal. Okay. And in fact, again, if you go to my website, charliehales.com, you'll see a couple of uh, position papers about this because it's really important. It's pretty technical. 
but it's pretty important. Okay. And that is right now over 14 percent of the city is locked up in urban renewal districts. What that means is that a lot of value there that could be paying for police and parks and schools and libraries and all the other basic services that people depend on is going to pay off debt for those urban renewal bonds. And I believe we need to start systematically pulling back the last year of those urban renewal districts where we can and start putting more of that value on the tax rolls mm -hmm. to pay for everything that the community needs. That will mean a smaller, more focused Portland Development Commission that's focused on areas where there's real problems to solve, not just pet projects to build. Mm -hmm. And it's focused more on neighborhoods where there's a particular need. So yeah, there's, it's time for a, a major course correction and a focusing on what we realistically can do with less money. Okay. Okay. Clearly major problems. I want to say something very small picture and specific, and then I want to say something general and big picture. Uh, small picture and specific, we are, what, spending about 25% of property tax revenues on urban renewal debt load, and we need to be thinking about not only large scale uh, projects that displace communities and then you have to figure out transportation solutions later uh, but also in thinking about smaller scale projects like the neighborhood prosperity initiative which has some good early feedback of actually taking neighborhood members to participate in how money should be spent and thinking about both smaller scale not as big a budgetary impact and more community engagement that's the kind of thing I think we should be looking at. The bigger picture thing should be motivating all of us, particularly if someone is running for mayor on the promise of addressing education, which is very important, not within the portfolio of the mayor, but very important. The understanding that we have been spending more on tax breaks over the years and relying more on tax breaks generally at the state level and at the local level and at the federal level is something we got to come to grips with. I worked on tax break reform in the legislature with a couple notable successes, but there's a lot more we've got to do at every level of government. Okay. Okay. All right, then. You mentioned the little point about education. I want to follow up on that piece. I think that's a very important piece that we need to talk about. Uh, the, uh, uh, the area that I want to talk about is that, uh, you know, we have the largest school district in the state of Oregon. Uh, it has also been said that we've got the highest dropout rates and life had failures. And also, we probably got a, a number of the issues in regards to young people. And we, we identified them as gang members. We got the crime thing and the whole nine yard aspect of it. And education has always been kind of like the, the thing that solves that problem. And here we got a big bond measure coming up for reconstruction of the, i.e., the, the structures, right, aspect of it. But then there's still this concern about what are we going to do about the failure rate in our education system? How do you want to address it? Well, this is a priority for me, and the mayor needs to be a champion for success of our schools in the city. And as I said, give people some certainty, not just hope, that the schools will be, there will be a cur complete curriculum for their kids, that there will be buildings in good condition, and that they'll be prepared for an earthquake, which we aren't now, uh, and that we do a better job of connecting school to work. And so not just with Portland Public School District, but with the six school districts that are either partially or completely within the city limits of Portland, the mayor should be an activist partner. First thing we need to do is go to the next session of the legislature and ask them to hold to their commitment for public education in Portland and everywhere else. And that that's the first responsibility of the legislature to fund schools, and it's the most important one. And it ought to be the one and only top tier item on the city of Portland's legislative wish list. Everything else, economic development, all that stuff's important, but there's nothing more important than having a good school for every kid. And then we need to find what's working in, the, in our schools, like the successful effort at Roosevelt that Charlene Williams has led that's raised test scores and raised graduation rates with focused grant money, parent involvement, business and community support, and an excellent teaching staff. She's proving that you really can make an urban school a success story, not just at Roosevelt, but she's a shining example, I think. So the mayor needs to be an activist partner. Bring the business community to them. Bring the Portland Workforce Alliance in and say, where are the job opportunities that we're going to connect these kids to? Rebuild the career and technical education program. There are only 800 kids at Benson now. Let's teach kids how to make things again for the ones that would like to do that and for whom college would just be debt. So let's have an education system that's not just the school district's problem, but that is an asset for us all.
Yeah. Education has been a priority for me, well, probably since I graduated from Grant High School, the year that Measure 5 and 50 were passed. And I has continued to be a priority in the legislature. It's why I've been endorsed by, I think it's related to why I'm endorsed by our teachers and endorsed by Mother Pack. It'll continue to be a priority for me as mayor. The thing I want to say to voters in Portland is that I won't run the school system, and I don't want to say that I will. There are a couple things I think we can do better and do to help. Uh, much of what is driving the achievement gap, and not only between students of color and white students and upper income students and lower income students, but between students in the United States and students overseas, is what happens and doesn't happen for students before the first day of school, before the first day of a school year over the summer, and before the very, very first day of school. I think there is a role that the city can play and, and the mayor can play as a convener to do a better job, invest more, bring nonprofits together, uh, work with our county libraries to reduce the summer slide and the summer gap and to improve early education opportunities. And that will be and is one of my top three priorities as mayor. Okay. Hmm. Question. okay. Um, you know, we have that new um, City Bureau to, uh, um, what do you call it, the one that's uh, Office helped of Equity? Office, Office of Equity. Equity and Human Rights. And you yeah. tell them not, well, never mind. Um, <laughs> the Office of Equity. What is your opinion of the Office of Equity, the Bureau? Do you see any problems with it? If you do, uh, what are they and what are you going to do to fix it? If you don't, um, what do you feel overall about it? We'll start off with you, Charlie. Equity is a priority for me and I think it will be for this City Council and it should be and equity doesn't just mean um, spreading the peanut butter across the bread evenly it means finding where we have failed to invest and failed to support communities within the city and doing more and it means having a workforce that reflects the city uh, an economic program that gives opportunity to everybody so having an office of equity is a tool I believe that that office should report directly to the mayor. And although I was skeptical about the formation of this office when it was first proposed because it wasn't a clear work program, now there is, and there's a good director. And I think that the only way that that has a shot at changing outcomes is if it directly reports to the mayor. So in addition to the police bureau and probably the planning and economic functions of the city, I'll assign the office of equity to myself as a bureau assignment after we've done our budget uh, and we are all working together on making sure that equity is driven through our budget. But I think the person that monitors that ought to be reporting directly to the mayor as a central management function of the city. That says a lot to the bureaucracy and to the community mm -hmm. that this is a priority. Mm -hmm. wow. You know, yeah. one thing, oh, oh did, you, did we get through? No, he no, definitely I'll answer the question, won't we? No, no, Jeff, no, yeah, no. You're Jeff, go on. on the, yeah, I'm the only candidate who has supported the Office of Equity from the beginning and not because I thought I knew all the answers, but because I did not, because I knew that we do not, that our city is changing and it isn't getting whiter, and I see it not merely when I am participating in a debate or running for mayor, I see it every day in my own neighborhood, in my own school district that has 80% of the kids on free or reduced price lunch and has kids who speak 73 languages, mm -hmm. our city is diversifying and we need to come to grips with that. And that needs to be a basic value, not only during a general election or campaign time, but through how we approach our work. It is a, and I want to make, clarify a couple of things, just so everybody knows what I was talking about a year ago and what I'm going to be talking about in a year. That our general goals in our administration will be getting the city working better for more people. That our policy values were a year ago, will are now, will be in a year. Prosperity, equity, sustainability, democracy. For the people who are working with me in my office, we'll continue to focus on those. I want to take one just more second to talk about ways we can improve the office equity. I think that we can amplify how they are working with other bureaus to not only say, all right, we have an office with nine staff who's trying to make sure we're doing better, but making sure that they're working with bureaus to set measurable objectives. Not only quotas for hiring, not really with a focus there, but what are the ways we can think about transportation for the whole city? How do parks work? How are we thinking in terms of age, age friendliness in our provision of services, in our contracting practices? How can we make that not only a segregated office of limited influence, but how do we make it something that impacts our practices and culture throughout the operation of city operations? 
Good, 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 good point. Okay. Well, we've got, about, we've got about another six minutes, but let me ask this other question. This, okay. is, this is one question that I was thinking, having run before in, in my lifetime, whatever. All too often, candidates who are running for office never get the, to be able to talk with the person who's holding the office. And my question to you guys, the two of you, is that were you given the opportunity to sit down with the mayor, this, uh, with Sam Adams, and talk to him about where he's at, his policies, and things of that nature, to hopefully form your own platform in terms of where you're going to be going? You, are you getting my point? Oh, of course. But Before more importantly, going. maybe even than that, I mean, I appreciate Sam's service, and I've certainly agreed with him on some things and disagreed with him on others, but certainly have a good dialogue there. But I also have a good working relationship with the rest of the folks that are going to be on the city council and then the, the two folks that are vi that are vying for the one seat that's uh, being contested. Okay. And then also, you know, you do, we, we, we use the word I way too much when we run for office. You do things in we. You do things in partnership with other people. So I have a great working relationship with Jeff Kogan, the county chair, and with the governor. So those partnerships are how you actually get things done. And in my case, you can look around the community and see a lot of the partnerships, not just hear that they could be, but see that they've actually made people's lives better. And that's what I'm looking forward to. Well, we only have two more minutes left, so in your little piece now, I'm going to give Jeff, and then you guys can end it accordingly to the voters. Okay. So, had the specific portion of your question yeah, right, yet, right, right. Uh, asked so for a meeting time. in the primary and in the general to have a focused set of questions as well as an open dialogue about what are the things that uh, he sees as facing the city, what are the most important things that are undone that he thinks uh, need to get done, who are some of the people who work within the city who are particularly talented, because, yeah, we've had some pretty public disagreements, the mayor and I, but no one can question his knowledge about city operations and so do want to leverage that as best we can and I do hope that I'm, I, I agree that we should be working with the whole city council and proud to be I think the only candidate in this race who's endorsed by a current member of the city council I think we'll have a good chance to work with uh, to work with other city commissioners and let me say something more about it I in fact think that we will have one of the most talented the most intelligent uh, perhaps the most ambitious city council in decades in the city. And the next mayor will have a role of empowering those people to accomplish their best objectives. If the next mayor can, and I've said this to I think every sitting member of the city council, as well as the candidates for city council, is that my hope is as mayor, I will not be trying to figure out how you can help me do my stuff, but how I can help you do your best stuff. And if we can do that, we can have an effective city. Okay. Well, you know, we've, we've sort of run, run out of time. So what we're going to do at this point in time, would each of you identify how do they, how can they contact you to get involved in the campaign? Sure. Well, I, ho quick, I hope you will quick. contact us because okay. we uh, we have a very important short period in which people can get involved. It's charliehales.com. Go to our website. Our campaign office is at 1220 Southeast Grand. So okay. stop by, get on the web. We'd love to have your help. Yeah. Yeah, go to the website, uh, which is my name, jeffersonsmith.com. You can also Google it. Watch two videos. You can pick which ones. Just watch two videos and then let us know what you think. You can also hit us on Facebook. We have about 8,300, 8,280, I think, uh, Facebook followers and friends uh, and a Twitter feed. Jefferson D. Smith is my personal. Also hit us up on the tweeters and the Facebooks. All right. Yep, same here. Gentlemen, thank you very much. Thank you. I mean, it's really been great. Fred, you did a good job. Good job. Folks, as George Page always said, back to what you believe in. But again, get out and vote. Get out and vote and participate. Very important. Take care. Good job. Good job. Thanks. Good job.